Greetings everybody, Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And you know what darkness is? It's merely the absence of light. And Christ is that light. Now, Satan may appear as an angel of light, but uh, he is his light is darkness. We are going to, well, let's talk about some things first. The two most hated doctrines on the face of this earth among Christian so-called clergy is who is Israel and who is not. Because if people knew who Israel was, they would be questioning who it is that claims to be Israel but are not. And then they would find out that they are actually the enemies of the cross of Christ. So, but the thing is, their secret is safe, pretty much safe because the average churchgoer, and I call them churchgoers, you know, you don't go to church because God's people are the church. You know, and people say, oh, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. No, you're not. You're going to go to a building that might have the name church on it, might be, you know, incorporated by the state of wherever you live with an IRS tax exemption, but that's not the church. No, it's a corporate business registered by the state. The people are the church. You know, just because I go to the garage doesn't make me a car. So... But the thing is, the secret is safe for the most part among 99% of whatever churchgoers, loosely speaking, because they won't even bother reading their Bible. You know, it, very, very few people have read the book cover to cover. Very, very few. I have, and I've listened to it on in audio and uh, done many, many, many subject Bible studies, you know, but I'm not just, you know, I'm not bragging. I mean, I'm not thinking I'm anything special, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it's sad. Uh, people won't even read the book. If they did, they would ask questions. Oh, wait a minute, pastor. You're, you're saying Rome is mystery Babylon, but the Bible says that mystery Babylon killed the prophets. Um, where did the Lord, when did the Lord send prophets to uh, Rome and who they killed? Who, who are these people? You know, it just doesn't work out. So, but some of us are probably, maybe many of us are going to end up dying for our faith. And I've known this since 19... The beginning of the 1990s, I've known that my faith in Christ would possibly lead to my death, which is fine, you know, but uh, some of us are going to get killed by the enemies, our enemies. Some of us are going to get our heads cut off under the uh, set of laws that uh, they claim Noah was given. And uh, some of us are going to go into the wilderness where we're going to possibly meet other people going, why is this happening to us? You know, God promised us the pre-trib rapture and we're still here. I guess I was never really saved. Well, that's their fault because they read a Scoville Bible, which was one of the things that... Uh, led to the identity theft. So, you know, 
People are so lazy. You know, they've never picked up the book. You know, people, Bible scholars died to translate the Bible into their own language. I mean, Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. And when Gutenberg invented the printing press, that was the first book he printed, was the Bible. Imagine that. And uh, let's see, well, Tyndale, William Tyndale in England translated the Bible into English, or at least a good portion of it, maybe not the whole thing. But uh, his uh, Bible was some of the basis of the King James Bible. And of course, uh, who was it? It was, um, oh boy, the guy that did the uh, Geneva Bible, uh, John Calvin. I had to think about his name. Um, you know, people have, Tyndale was burned at the stake and the Vatican wanted to kill Martin Luther, but God's hand was on him. And uh, Calvin fled to Switzerland. Now, I don't know. I've heard mixed things about Calvin, but, you know, I'm not going to judge another man's servant. All I know is John Calvin spent a lot of time helping translate the uh, Geneva Bible. So, and sadly, Geneva is now a... Uh, where all the uh, banksters uh, go to plot their craft, but, you know, what can I tell you? But there's going to be those of you that are going to go into the wilderness, just like Revelation 12 says, and people are going to be asking questions. And it's going to be up to probably some of you, maybe some of you will have to give an answer. In the Greek, there's a word called, I think it's apologia. It's where we get the word apology. But it doesn't mean, in the Bible sense, it doesn't mean, gee, I'm sorry for being a Christian. No. Apologia meant to give an answer. And uh, let's take a look at that. In uh, Peter, 1 Peter, Chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer, apologia, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're supposed to be able to give an answer. If somebody asks you, who's Jesus? Can you give them an answer? Can you? You know, but uh, that's what the word apologia, I, I, I might be pronouncing that wrong because I, I didn't take Greek and Hebrew in Bible college, but I know that word uh, answer is where we got the word for a, apology. Uh, matter of fact, there's a branch of Bible study called uh, apologetics and that is the study of giving an answer for the faith for example people will say oh well Noah's Ark that's a, that's just a big stupid uh, boat story but you know there was a marine engineer that built a scale model of the ark, put it in some water, like a big fish aquarium, and he started tilting the thing at 45 degrees and then the other direction 45 degrees and was creating, you know, wave action. And he found out that the um, ark was about the most stable platform for a ship that could be built. I mean, let's face it, the thing wasn't made to 
um, travel fast. It was just meant to uh, stay afloat. And uh, he was amazed at it. You know, here it is. You got a guy that's a marine engineer. And, uh, you know, I think he became a believer. I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't seen that video. Boy, that was a long time ago. Back in the 90s, I saw that. But I remember that. And he actually did a demonstration showing that. But, you know, that's giving an answer. But sadly, people are foolish. They won't bother reading the Bible. So, when people tell them that the when you get so-called clergy, well, wolves, behind the pulpit, well, in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, they give you a warning. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves, grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And that's what we have today. But because people don't bother to read the book, they don't know. Not only do they not know who Israel is, they don't even know that God has enemies. And God's enemies are our enemies. So let's take a look. You know, uh, in Luke 19, 27, Jesus had some strong words. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, R-E-I-G-N, as in ruling and reigning, not water falling from the sky. You know, the monarch's reign, Queen Elizabeth's monarch, the monarch, uh, the queen, the monarch, was her reign was decades, right? So, Jesus said, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Those that won't have me to be ruler over, over them, bring them here and kill them before me. Mine enemies. Boy, when's the last time you heard that preached? in church so-called uh probably never but i'll bring it to you but those that do make it into the wilderness where god's going to have his remnant people are going to be asking why is all this falling upon us why is all this evil falling upon us why do all these heathen aliens that flooded our land why do they want to kill us well, part of it is they're jealous. I mean, let's face it. God blessed the white Western nations beyond anything the rest of the world had. But we've turned our back on Christ, and now he's turned his back on us. And all the plagues and curses are that were promised in the Old Testament are coming upon our nation. And we are entering into the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's another reason why they don't believe uh, the churches in the West don't believe in the church going to be here for the tribulation because they don't think they're Jacob. And... Uh, you know, pre-trib rapture. See, the pre-trib rapture doesn't work if you know who Jacob Israel is. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, people. Um, and Abraham was the grandfather of Jacob Israel. So, all right, with that in mind, we're going to read uh, Colonel Jack Moore continuation of the series of the marks of Israel God's promises to Israel 
Now, remember, there are conditional covenants. Uh, a conditional covenant, you could call it like a contract. Hey, uh, Jimmy Bob, I want to buy your your uh, 95 Chevrolet. Now, nah, let's make it a Toyota. Toyota's the last. Um, he says, sure, Bob. Uh, I'll sell it to you for two grand. Oh, okay. But I've had other people call me and they want to buy it. So, you know, you better hurry up. Well, I tell you what, Jimmy Bob, I I'll give you $200 down right now. You hold it for me, and either tonight or tomorrow, I'll give you the rest of the money. And uh, Jimmy Bob says, ah, Bob, you got a deal. So the next day, you show up with the rest of the money. He, You give him the money, he gives you the car. That's a contract. That's a covenant. God says, you do this, I'll do that. That's a conditional covenant. But then, God has some unconditional promises that he made for his people. So you got to realize there's conditional and unconditional promises. That would be a good Bible study in and of itself, I'm sure. So, all right, so this is part five of the Marks of Israel, Colonel Moore. And this is his points 10 and probably 11 and 12. So let's take a look. Please turn your Bible to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is such a neglected book. I mean, there's... Isaiah is... Somebody once said that Isaiah is probably uh, is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. And I believe that. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 49. All right, let's read Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O isles. That's a shortened form of islands. What uh, islands do God's people live in? Well, we used to be God's people. But uh, the United Kingdom, England, Ireland, Scotland, you know, Greece. Uh, yeah, Greece is a, a nation of islands. I mean, you've got mainland too, but I mean, it's there's a lot of islands. And the New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek church, the most persecuted church in the history of the world, spread the gospel. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. And we're talking about a shaft of an arrow here, right? And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Now let me ask you a question. What group of people built all the churches all over the world? Certainly not the Hindus. It wasn't the Africans. It wasn't the Japanese or the Chinese or the Mongolians. Those in South and Central America had never even heard the name Jesus until Spanish and Portuguese explorers went to across the ocean in their ships. Think about it. Only in the West has Jesus Christ been glorified. I mean, after all, who printed the Bibles? 
the Germans originally and the English you know think about it who built all the churches do you have Africans going to Europe and building the churches the buildings no absolutely not no thou art my servant O Israel in whom I will be glorified then I said I have labored in vain I have spent my strength for naught and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. Verse 5. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob again to him, though Israel be not gathered. Why is that? Because they were dispersed. God scattered them for their disobedience. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore, to restore the preserved of Israel. And I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that word translated here as Gentiles is just the word nations. Sometimes heathen nations, sometimes the nations of Israel, depending upon the context. And I know uh, the so-called wolves behind the pulpit will tell you that Gentiles means non-Jew, but that is not true. Read Jeremiah 3.8 where God said he divorced Israel, but not Judah. There's 12 tribes. When you go to the book of Revelation and you read about the New Jerusalem, it has 12 gates into the city. And one of the tribe's names is on each of the gates. There's not a 13th non-Israel tribe gentile gate it's not there okay it's not there jeremiah 3 8 read it god divorced israel but not judah but in jeremiah 31 31 god said he'd make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah those are the gentiles that we are referring to. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. See, Israel was spread all over the place, unto the ends of the earth. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of the entire world? No! Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. Redeemed for what? From the, the, the curse of sin and death. We were under the curse of sin and death. We had to have somebody pay the price. We had to have a Redeemer. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One. To, uh, to him whom man despiseth, Who's the Holy One that man despiseth? Christ. To him whom the nation abhorreth. Abhorreth. That's just a fancy old English way of saying hated. To a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel. And he shall choose thee. Wow. 
All right, verse 8. Listen carefully. Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Um, do you know many, many parts of the earth were desolate? They were wildernesses. And who spread abroad and had colonies and created civilizations. Think about it. They came to what we now call the United States and took a wilderness and created a civilization. South Africa. Well, that's, that's going in reverse now. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, you know, Think about it. Greenland, Iceland. I mean, civilization. We're not talking about living out in the, you know, in a mud hut in the middle of the savannah. De uh, savannah. No. They caused them to inherit the desolate heritages. Colonies. Well, guess what? Oh, let's look at uh, Isaiah 54 also. All right, let's look at, look at Isaiah 54. Verse 1. Sing, O barren, that thou didst not bear. Well, we're talking about children here. Break forth into singing and cry aloud that thou didst not travail with cry, uh, travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. See, people, it was the West that created all the colonies. Think about it. The very thing that the non-whites hate us for, God promised to us. Verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and thy seed shall inherit the nations and make the desolate cities to be inhabited wow god's people would inherit the nations and make the desolate cities to be inhabited right fear not for thou shalt not be ashamed neither be thou confounded for thou shalt not be put to shame for thou shalt forget the name of thy youth i'm sorry the shame for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Now remember, in Jeremiah 3.8, God called Israel his bride, and he divorced her. Think about it. And the church is likened unto his bride. Israel was likened to be a bride. But if you listen to the modern day church, they'll tell you that Israel and the church are two different, different things. But the Bible teaches God only has one bride. He doesn't have two brides. A, a Israel bride that they'll tell you is the Jays and then another one that's the church. God doesn't have two brides even though they'll try to make you think he does. Verse 5. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, 
and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, that's Christ, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Because in Jeremiah 3, 8, God divorced his wife, Israel. Verse 7. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy, mercy on thee, saith the Lord, thy Redeemer. So, and you can keep reading this. And, uh, I mean, this is, uh, these are end time messianic promises, a lot of this, uh, if you keep reading this, Jeremiah 54. It's, it's, Really incredible, if you ask me. All right. Um, so Israel was to have immense colonies. And it would seem the British Commonwealth would qualify here. I mean, it was said that the sun never set on the British Empire. And that was true uh, for a time. You know, they had colonies in Asia, uh, Singapore, they had colonies in India. They had colonies all over the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. All right, point number 11. It is said that Israel, Colonel Moore says, Israel will push the people together. So let's go to Genesis chapter 33 and verse 17 and see what it says. Um... Let's see. I'm sorry. Not Genesis 33. We're going to take a look at a couple things. Genesis 26 and verse 4. God says, And I will make thy seed, children, to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That word nation is the same word that they translate sometimes as Gentiles. It's the same word. Genesis 27, 29. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. Genesis 35, 11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, the newspapers say, oh, there's too many people in the world. Have an abortion. Don't have children. God said, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations, plural, shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. Hmm. How about Exodus 34, 24? God says, For I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Uh, there were three times a year when the Lord was uh, wanting his people to go to the tabernacle, temple. Uh, one was Passover. The other was the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'm not sure about the other one. It might have been trumpets. So I'm not sure. In Numbers 24.8, a prophet, a greedy prophet, said, God brought him forth out of Egypt, Israel. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. And by the way, people, you know what the unicorn is? It's a one-horned Indian rhinoceros. African rhinos have two horns. Yeah. 
Matter of fact, you know what it's called? It's called the unicornus rhinoceros. Uni meaning one. Uh, and that's the Latin name, unicornus rhinoceros. Yeah. When did it become a horse with a horn coming out of its forehead? Well, that's the, you know, the media. Look it up, Indian rhinoceros. Look it up. God brought him, Israel, forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies. He, Israel, shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Wow. All right, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built. O virgin of Israel, thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant, and shall eat them as common things. For there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. See, people will be going to the Lord. Verse 7. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. The chief of the nations. What is the chief? Well, the chief is the ruler. You ever heard of a fire chief? Well, you know, in America. Or how about an Indian chief? He led the tribe, right? Jacob Israel was to be the chief of the nations. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. What country is north of Israel? Uh, Europe. Yeah, I know a lot of you probably have never taken geography before, but uh, if you get a map and you look at Israel, the land, Palestine, and you look north, guess what? That's where Europe is. When God comes, when Christ comes with his armies to destroy this wicked world, he's going to bring Israel, his people, from the north country. You know, the land where God had blessed his people with crops, the people that printed the Bibles, the people that built the churches in his honor. Yeah. Behold, I, the Lord, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth because they were spread out everywhere. New Zealand, Australia, from America. And with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. And those that tell you that the Antichrist little nation over in the Middle East that was created by the United Nations in 1948, is this, this prophecy being fulfilled, are either deceivers or are horribly deceived and have zero spiritual discernment, if you ask me. 
because I haven't seen Christ return in glory gathering his people. And if you think the Antichrist United Nations is fulfilling that, well, you're, I don't know. I, I might call them an idiot, but, you know. Verse 9. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them, and I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. Are the British Isles afar off from um, the land of Israel? Yeah. How about Australia? That land's that isle is pretty far off. New Zealand? Oh, yeah. And declare it in the isles afar off and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Didn't Christ say he was a good shepherd? Absolutely. For the Lord shall redeem Jacob and ransom him from the hand of him, hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil. Wheat. Didn't Christ say he was the bread of life? For wine? Uh, didn't he at the Last Supper say uh, the wine was his blood for the new covenant? And for oil. What was oil represented of? Oil was always representative of the Holy Spirit. For wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall sorrow. They shall not sorrow anymore at all. And you can keep reading this. Um, you know. Lord makes a lot of promises, and he keeps his promises. Some are conditional, some are unconditional. And all this evil is falling upon our people now because we have forsaken the Lord, and we're doing everything that God hates. And we tolerate all the things that God hates. We tolerate so much filth. You know, and God's not going to stop what you're willing to tolerate. Well, everybody, I think that concludes this Bible study for today. Um, you know, the God's marks on Israel is pretty plain and, a, 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 you know, apparent. You know, God said he would make of Abraham a father of many nations and one little Antichrist nation over in the Middle East is not many so you know think about it so with that in mind all blessings praise glory and honor in Jesus precious name amen